Okay, let's uh, continue on day two, and uh, this is Google Fine presenting the project. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Leonard. Um, we did uh, Bayesian optimization with distributed Gaussian processes and additional deep kernel learning. Um, so Bayesian optimization is a method for optimizing black box functions that has tons of applications in engineering. So basically, whenever your function needs, uh, requires running a simulation or it's like otherwise expensive to evaluate, you basically cannot approximate gradients and then you need to do something else. Um, and in our case, we would build a surrogate model of the function, which is a Gaussian process. So these are just a, just a few applications for this. Uh, hyperparameter optimization, probably the most prominent one. Um, yeah, exactly. So that yeah, you can, if you if you cannot approximate gradients and cannot do gradient descent, you could uh, learn a mod surrogate model of the function, for example, using splines. Um, but the the advantage of Gaussian processes is that they provide you a measure of uncertainty. So, right. So assume you have evaluated a few points, like the Gaussian process tells you in this area it is not certain what the function value is, and then you could like decide to pick such a point to evaluate next to reduce the uncertainty in your model. That's the rough idea of Bayesian optimization. Um, Manu, Manu talks more about this. So we implement a scalable algorithm for high dimensional Bayesian optimization. Um, and this works by running multiple GPs in parallel on different workers. Um, Can I ask a really quick question? Yeah. So is it Bayesian here because the hyperparameters that define the surrogate family have priors that are formalized here? Yeah. So yeah, so exactly. Standard. So your, your GP yeah. has some um, hyperparameters and that basically defines the prior. And the thing I've shown above yeah. is then the posterior, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So as I said, this occurs in a couple of applications. Um, it is scalable because we basically have a couple of GPs. Each of them uh, has their own uh, set of observations. And like in principle, GPs require cubic um, complexity to compute the posterior, but we make every worker have their own set of points. So it's only cubic in a, in a lower number of points. Um, and our contributions is that we provide a start implementation of a Bayesian optimization algorithm called Turbo. Um, yeah, that's just the rough outline. We we go into more detail now. All right. So I'll talk about the background of Bayesian optimization, like a quick crash course. <laughs> uh, right. So yeah, the goal of uh, Bayesian optimization is to solve an optimization problem of this form. Uh, that we have an objective function from a set X to the real numbers. Uh, the set X is uh, compact, typically a, a hypercube of dimension D. Uh, the function F is expensive to evaluate in terms of cost and or time. And it lacks special structure that we can utilize. So it's a black box. And uh, we can only typically sample the function at certain values. And we have no explicit information about first or second order derivatives. And so it's known as derivative free optimization. And uh, the framework can uh, allow for uh, corrupted uh, function values by some noise. And uh, yeah, we seek uh, global optimums, not local. All right, it has many applications. And so here is the basic. Uh, uh, two components used in uh, Bayesian optimization. The first thing is a model that has predictions with uncertainties. And this thing we call a surrogate model. And then uh, we need a thing called the acquisition function, which decides uh, which points should we sample next to evaluate the function at. Uh, and so here is the vanilla algorithm for Bayesian optimization. Uh, so we initialize by uh, picking uh, n0 initial points, uh, typically uniformly at random, and evaluate the function there. And then while we are within a budget, we update our surrogate model of the function on all the previous available data. And then we optimize the acquisition function 
to get the next point uh, x m plus one. We evaluate the function there. We uh, increment, and then when we're out of budget, we return a solution to the problem. Right. So, but then we have replaced sort of one optimization problem here by a sequence of optimization problems here. But the uh, the thing here is that it's typically much easier to optimize this one here. Uh, and uh, so one important aspect here is uh, designing the acquisition function and it, it trades off between uh, exploration and exploitation. Um, right, and so yeah, it's typically cheap to evaluate and uh, typically we have a first and second order derivative information of the acquisition function. And then we can apply standard techniques from non-linear optimization to solve these simplified problems. So that's the basic stuff. Quick question. Yeah. Do you take advantage of pseudo-random or quasi-random streams here, possibly to make some noise? Yeah, uh, for optimizing this one? But, yeah, just based on optimization in general. Uh, so right now it's mostly Yes, like yes, I think they are. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's basically thirty point arithmetic and pseudo random streams, no quasi random streams, right? It's not about what you talked about yesterday with the internal okay. well, uh, metrics. Yeah. And, no. Yeah. Uh, right. And then now I'll talk about the surrogate model typically used, which is Gaussian processes. Um, Right, and one can see Gaussian processes as an uh, infinite generalization of uh, uh, multivariate uh, normal distributions. So uh, a Gaussian process is just a stochastic process. We do know that uh, the process that uh, it's sampled from the GP parameterized by something, a function called mu zero and a kernel K here. And uh, the property is that if we take any finite uh, collection of points, uh, these here, uh, we have that uh, the process at these points has a normal distribution with some mean and some covariance matrix. Uh, the mean is simply given by the mean uh, function, and uh, the covariance matrix is given by the kernel function. And so um, one thing to note here is that the kernel has to be such that uh, given um, any such initial points, uh, the resulting covariance matrix has to be positive semi-definite. Right, and then here are some typical examples of uh, kernel functions. Um, so this one is the uh, power exponential, and here is the uh, modern kernel, and this is the one we use. And uh, the exact form doesn't matter, but it has a few hyperparameters. So here, L1, L1, 2D, and sigma. And these are typically uh, estimated from data using MLE or MAP. It's maximal effort estimation. Yes, maximum maximal process theory. Yeah. yeah. So this is the Bayesian part you were uh, talking about before. Right, so why do we use Gaussian processes? Well, one reason is that they inherit many nice properties from uh, multivariate Gaussians, and uh, moreover, they are like sample efficient, and with their predict uh, predictions, they give uncertainties in a natural way. And so in particular, if we're given a set of uh, points and function values at those points or observations, and we, we want to know the uh, posterior or the value of the process at the test point, then we have this particular uh, distribution. It's a a uh, univariate normal with a certain mean and a certain standard deviation. Uh, and they're given explicitly here and here. Um, so th this gives us a way to uh, quantify the uncertainty in our predictions. So this is the Gaussian uh, process regression. And this was what we saw, I say, in the first slide uh, here. This is the posterior distribution done. Example of that. Right. And yeah, if you want to go further, here's a visual uh, exploration of Gaussian processes that complements our presentation. So you can watch that in your own time. So, all right. And then there was this second component of uh, 
acquisition functions. And as I said previously, they balance uh, exploration, exploitation in different ways. And there is no universal best method. One very common um, acquisition function is the expected improvements. Uh, it's given uh, here. So it's uh, uh, on average, how much do we expect to improve if we pick the point X? That's what it says. And in the particular case with the Gaussian processes, it has this explicit formula, doesn't matter. Uh, and then here is another one, upper confidence bound. But the one we use is uh, Thompson sampling. So essentially it samples uh, uh, a function uh, from the posterior from the Gaussian process and essentially only optimize over that. So it's uh, super sample efficient. Right. And it has the nice property that um, it allows for parallel function evaluations, right? So you can draw multiple samples and then optimize each of them, and each of them would give you a different optimum. Whereas for EI expected expected improvement, you would always get the same point if you maximize it. So it's map reducible with basic smart communication protocols now, right? Yeah. And not embarrassingly yeah. parallel, right? Because we still need to communicate the learned things, right? Um, in principle, yes, but we in the end we we do it uh, okay differently <laughs> somehow. Um, so, um, so there is. I mean, in principle, this entire Bayesian optimization framework is more or less non-parallelizable, except for that you could do multiple function evaluations at a time. But um, as your GP grows, as I said, like the, uh, the complexity grows cubically in the number of points, so it all gets very extensive um, and it doesn't scale very well. So there's this paper on um, doing Bayesian optimization via trust regions. And the idea is that you have a rectangular um, that defines a trust region and that is always centered on the current best point. Um, and when you want to create new candidates, you only consider points within this region. And this region shrinks over time and it gives you another um, layer of scalability um, because it works better if your, fun if your problem is high dimensional. Um, because like, Gaussian processes have this problem that they don't work very well in high dimensions and then restricting the search space helps a lot. Um, and what you can do, of course, now is just to use multiple trust regions. Um, and the point is that every trust region maintains their own set of observations. So there is no communication between the different trust regions. Each of them has their own observations and optimizes their own part of the function, so to say. Um, so that is that is what we do. Um, so yeah, we run a set of trust regions in parallel, um, but we also do multiple function evaluations because we use Thomson sampling and it allows that. So we have multiple trust regions and in each trust region, we generate a batch of, of new points to evaluate. And how do you initialize the center of these and trust regions? Um, so what we do is to, I mean, there are multiple ways to do this, but what we do is just to sample a low set, uh, a low number of points using a different seed, and then each trust region is centered on the best. So what could happen is that a trust region is converged to the same point in principle, um, but we don't consider this case, and it's not often considered in the literature either. Um, we just ignore this case. <laughs> You, you probably could do better by avoiding such cases, but that is what we do. I think another way would be, for example, to use a um, like Sobol sequence and then center the first uh, one yeah. on the best point, the next one on the second best. Yeah, that's exactly the quasi random. So yeah. So we can use that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so in the original, so this paper is called Turbo. It's trust region the old. So the, or stretch to call it turbo then, but um, that's where the name comes from. What they do is when they have multiple trust regions is that when they fill a batch that they want to evaluate, they take the best candidates from the different trust regions, but that requires some communication between trust regions. So we don't do that part, but we basically only evaluate um, a batch for each trust region separately. And under the assumption that we have some cluster that we can take advantage of, that's just more scalable in our 
opinion. Um, a turbo is implemented was was implemented for like for a single machine. Um, if we want to take advantage of a cluster. So we have this other um, part of the project, which is deep kernel learning. Um, and the idea of deep kernel learning is to just learn a representation of your points. Um, so we saw earlier that you can optimize the entire GP using maximum likelihood. And in the same fashion, you can just um, put your, your points in the input space into some neural network that gives you some output put that output in the kernel um, and then do your entire thing on the output, like on the representation of this neural network. Um, and the neural network is then trained using the maximum likelihood estimation. Um, yeah, we wanted to experiment with that um, because the idea is that if your points are very high dimensional, you could reduce them to lower dimensional points and everything should be more efficient. Um, but of course, it's somewhat hard to learn this neural network. So using the neural network is essentially basically allowing this beast to do your manipulation functions yeah. instead of using, say, the mixtures of its internals, right? Yeah. And the, it also yeah. aggregates the information of each turbo. So we run multiple turbos, so and then we aggregate the information that they learned in this uh, effective representation. Yeah, and then we do another turbo run, and so on and so on. So yeah. This is some kind of transfer yeah. learning of what was learned. So yeah. yeah, and then um, they, they will use this same learned kernel, these local GPs mm -hmm. in the future, mm -hmm. and then they will improve their representation. Yeah. Our basic thought process was that when we did the like the first optimization, we want to do something with the points we gathered so far. So um, yeah, we decided to, to learn a representation. And I mean, if you if you have a function where some of the dimensions don't matter at all, the idea is that the neural network learns to just ignore these um, points because they don't play a role for the likelihood. Um, yeah, so our final algorithm, like very roughly is why we still have evaluation budget, um, we have multiple trust regions in parallel. We initialize them with some initial points. Then we center the trust regions on, on the best initial point. Um, and we initialize our GP with the initial observations. Um, then for each trust region, we run turbo until it terminates and it terminates when the trust region becomes too small. Um, then we aggregate all the data we have gathered so far, train the deep kernel, uh, the deep kernel or retrain it if we already trained it before um, and use this kernel uh, as the kernel in the GP. Right, so the first time we run it, we don't have a deep kernel because we don't have any, anything to learn it from. Um, but as soon as we did one run of optimization, we replace the kernel with the deep kernel. And is the network architecture allowed to evolve? No. It's, it's fixed. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, so we had some problem um, getting this to run on the cluster. So it's probably because of our of how our code was set up. So what we did is to put it everything in a package and install this package on the cluster, and then um, all the workers have, have it available, um, and then you we avoided these um, serialization issues. Um, so what I do here is to uh, print the code in Markdown cells. You see it on this website. It's actually it has um, it shows the like it has Python syntax support, so it has the proper syntax highlighting. But here it only is black and white. Um, yeah, so we have this function to evaluate uh, an objective that basically takes a point and. Uh, projects it out of this zero one hypercube that we had because like a function might have different bounds so this is everything it does um yeah we have some abstract function for an optimization problem which is importantly the dimensionality as a um, as a parameter then we have a function that gives you the lower and upper bounds of the function it's pretty much everything you need to know from the function and you need to be able to call it um, and then we have two test functions, Eki and Griwonk. So these are commonly used um, test functions for Bayesian optimization. Um, Griwonk is super multimodal, and Eki is also super multimodal, but it's this very steep uh, minimum. 
and Grewong is basically like a parabola, but then it's still super multimodal in between. So yeah, we have this um, data class turbo state that has these properties of the trust region, length, minimum length, maximum length. Um, then it has this failure counter because if you make sufficiently often pr uh, progress in the optimization, you increase the trust region and uh, inversely you uh, shrink the trust region. So that defines the turbo state. Uh, then we have some function that updates the state of the algorithm. So updates the length, um, depending on your function value. And then we have the optimize function. So we sample the number of initial points, we evaluate them, we add them to the uh, to the observations we have so far. Then as long as the trust region hasn't uh, terminated, we, we scale the function values um, because they could be like, they could have very high uh, standard deviation in order to avoid that because it doesn't work well with GPs. Then we call our function, um, generate a batch of candidates, evaluate them, update them, to uh, add them to the observations. And here we train the GP. Um, the initial points, as I said, are drawn by a Sobel sequence, a scrambled Sobel sequence. Um, the deep kernel model is just a neural network that's like, yeah, just a fully connected neural network with ReLU activations. And then the deep kernel GP reversal is basically just a GP that first calls the neural network before um, putting, like, putting the points in the kernel function. Um, right, and we have this function that is around all of that because we have multiple of these uh, turbo instances in parallel. So we need a Spark session, then we have all these parameters. Um, we allow to use the deep kernel or not. So we have one run where we don't use it at all and just use a standard kernel, then one run where we actually use the deep kernel. Then we just spawn a bunch of turbo instances. Um, after every of them has finished, we, um, we collect their data. Oops. We add them to our aggregated um, observations. We train the deep kernel with that. But in the end, we save our observations. And here's a function that trains the deep kernel um, using the marginal log likelihood of the GP. And what's the serialization, the serialization field in there? Like, I mean, this is far, right? Yeah. So, what was the question? How did you get around in the serialization issues? Um, so by just putting everything in a, in a package and installing the package on the cluster, um, because we had some functions that couldn't be serialized, because there are some restrictions to what you can serialize. I don't know what it is exactly, um, but yeah, like yeah, I think I guess you could get it to run um, somehow, but we decided to keep our code as it is. Only just a package, then it worked. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the key part of the um, of the implementation. Built, did you import it as a Python wheel? Yeah, Python? yeah, we we built it as a Python wheel and then it was also installed. And this now is like the actual notebook that we run on Databricks. Um, so we have this package scalable GPs from which we we'll, uh, import. Um, and this just runs a bunch of experiments. So for each objective, using deep kernel or not, and then for five repetitions, uh, run the entire thing, save the results. Um, yeah, and then in the end, you get some, wait, some of the proper plots. Yeah, you get some results and they show that the deep kernel doesn't perform as well as you would like it to. Um, but I think it makes sense because it just seems to be too hard to tra train this neural network with little uh, function, like this low data. So you probably would need to regularize your neural network a lot or do something smart. Um, yeah. So there are some, some additional uh, code 
that describes the that basically lists the entire thing like in their orig original structure because I I had a bit of a different structure for uh, pedagogic reasons but yeah this is the entire code then basically that's it okay let's um, Are there any questions? So when you train the technology, you need to maximize the exact value of it. Yeah. How, how scalable is that? Is that distributed in some way? That yeah, no. Um, so we have some additional part here for that, uh, somewhere here. Um, the problem we had there is that we didn't get this. So we tried this uh, package called um, Spark Torch, which allows for Torch optimizer to be run on Spark in a distributed fashion. But we ran into some problems with that. So because in a short of time we reverted to just doing standard Spark uh, to, to do standard Torch, which did it only on one driver. Um, but the idea was to do it in a distributed manner. Um, that's Still, the like this part is only linear in the number of points, and the GP part is cubic. So we thought it's at least way more scalable than uh, than doing all the GP stuff on on one driver. Um, yeah. I mean, I I think uh, this is really good, and I should point out to a few resources. You know, um, something called Maggie, um, uh, Jim Dowling. You know, from ATH, mm -hmm. he gave a presentation about pop works, right? There was a really elegant algorithm from the ATH group there. It's, it's called oh. MAGGY or GGIE. What Maggie does is really cute because it actually allows you to override Spark's uh, stage uh, stage blocks, you know? And it kind of, it's a really cute trick. So you can actually start communicating very, very directly uh, using Maggie on Spark. Yeah. But then I don't know the details of how to extend the Pythonic things, but that sh you should be able to figure it out. I can sort yeah. out. Because then you basically will have a completely um, flexible Spark program, right? Where now you think of the user as someone who wants to tweak and play around. And, and um, so I think that's just another stun. And I would say if you guys did that, you should consider presenting this in like a Spark, uh, sorry, Data AI Summit in, in Europe that will happen in a few uh, months. Yeah. And uh, by the way, all of you guys, uh, the point is maybe, you know, presented at a paper like two years ago, there were two student publications um, that resulted. And, uh, and then if you do, then um, yeah, we have to cite like um, AWS and Databricks, so I'll, 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 not just the WASP, right? So just just ping me if you, if, you, if you get something out of this. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to add me as an author or anything, but, uh, but I'm legally bound to um, yeah, cite uh, the cloud providers for this. Yeah, so it's good if you if you can send me the link. That... Yes, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start discussion too on this. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, thank you again.